Hello everyone and welcome back to our Wednesday Bible study on the book of Hebrews. Just as we start this evening, let's just once again pause and pray together. Father, thank you again for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to come together, to look at your words, to study it, uh, to explore it. Lord, as we do so, we again continue to pray for our land and our world at this time. We've been listening to what's going on with COVID and the people who've lost their lives and our hearts go out to their families. And Lord, we continue to pray for wisdom, for our leaders, for strength, for our health services. Uh, and Lord, just for that we, the people, would be sensible uh, in everything that's happening. Lord, thank you that we can draw aside from that this evening to study your word. We just ask that you be with us now Again, Lord, that you would come to us, that you would open our eyes and hearts to you and to your words, that you would encourage us and challenge us with what it has to say. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, we're going to get back into um, Hebrews chapter 5 tonight, um, possibly into chapter 6. We'll wait and see how we get on. But I'm going to start off by reading from verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 5. This is what it says. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest and he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The God and God designed him to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. There is much more that we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know what to do and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognise the difference between right and wrong. Amen. And that's the end of Hebrews chapter 5. Um, I had said at one stage we'll get back into what it means to be uh, a priest of the order of Melchizedek. We will do that in chapter 7 whenever we read a bit more about that in Hebrews but this starts off in verse 7 with saying, While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleading with loud, with loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. You know, it talks about how Jesus prays and pleads. Probably the best um, example of that that we have is Jesus near the end of his time here on earth, whenever he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he cries out to his heavenly father. You know, if you read the passages in Matthew chapter 26 or in Luke chapter 22, you hear all about that. Jesus taking some of the disciples with him, how they fall asleep. Jesus comes back and wakes them up and they fall asleep again. But it talks about Jesus going off and, and he prays and he pleads with his heavenly father. And probably the two things from those passages which stand out very much are, it talks about if this, you can take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is pleading with his father about what is to come. Uh, and then it talks about him sweating um, great drops of sweat as if they were blood. Um, again, that sense that he's very under a lot of stress, a lot of strain. Um, you know, he's out in a cold sweat as he's thinking about what lies ahead. And that shows us different things. It shows us how Christ is human um, and it knows that he is fearful about what is coming but yet he still faces that. You know and in Hebrews 7 it talks about um, Jesus offering prayers with loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. Jesus said if this cup can be taken from me but not my will but yours be done. That's rescue from death, rescue from the cross and what was going to happen. But Jesus still was willing to go knowing what was going to happen. What does that mean to us as we face suffering? 
as we face trials. We can't see the big picture. We can't see what God has laid out before us. Uh, we can't see the reason. We just know that we're going through something. Yeah, pretty obvious at the minute that we're going through COVID, but set COVID aside for a moment. Just think back over life and to date. Think about those times that have been troubling for you, those times that have been difficult, those times whenever you felt that the world was against you. Um, and then see, see how God has used those. Can you see God's hand? Can you see God using those experiences to teach you something, to show you something, or to give you that experience so that you could draw alongside somebody else? You know, we talk about the benefit of hindsight, and it is very much the benefit of hindsight, uh, the benefit of, of what we have been through and how that equips us better for the future. That's something we'll come on to in this passage with Christ. But, you know, whenever we do seriously look back at what we've experienced, and we do take time to pray about that and to reflect upon it, you know, we can see where God is in, in, the, in, the, in the darkness. We can see where God has used things for us. We can see how maybe the most painful experience that we've ever gone through, that that then equips us to walk with somebody else. You know, whenever we're going through trials and tribulations, whenever we're going through troubles, it's not what we look for. We look for somebody who can all understand Somebody who can empathise with us, somebody who, who has some sort of notion of what we are suffering so that we know that we're not alone. And God does bring alongside us people who have been through similar circumstances and who will walk with us, who will pray with us, who'll just listen to us whenever we need that. But then we can do that with others because of our experiences. And that's what makes us mature in life and mature in our spiritual life. Something again which the, the writer talks about later on in this passage. And, and to have that maturity, to have that breadth and depth of life experience, um, how God can use that. Well, look at what it says in Hebrews. It talks about Jesus pleading out, rescue him from death. And girl, God heard his cries because of his deep reverence for God. Again, God heard the cries of Jesus. God always hears our prayers, always hears um, what is going on. He, he, there's nothing that he misses. I mean, look back in the Old Testament, look back at the, the times of Judges, uh, a downward spiral in the life of, of the Israelites. Um, but how, whenever they're having a real downward time, how they, they plead, they cry out to God, how God hears them and answers their prayer and gives sense of a judge to, to lead them, to guide them, to help them. But then how the people turn their back on God again and, and then there's, there's suffering, there's, there's, there's judgment, there's, there's punishments and how they cry out to God again and, and how that goes round and round. God doesn't stop listening to them. He does get to a point where he says enough is enough and he will punish them, but he never stops listening. He never closes his ears to them and God never closes his ears to us. Uh, it talks about how God heard Jesus' prayers because of his deep reverence for him. Um, Jesus understands perfectly who God is and all about him and, and what he's like. So if Jesus can cry out to God, uh, knowing that God will answer his prayers in his will, then so should we. It says that even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Jesus wasn't immune from suffering. Jesus was born as a human being. He gave up heaven and came and was born as a baby to live on earth. Yes, to be the perfect sacrifice for us, but living as a person would mean more problems, more tribulation, more suffering. He experienced bereavement. Uh, we see that whenever Lazarus dies and it says that Jesus wept. Even though Jesus knows what's coming, he still weeps because he knows the suffering. God understands us. Jesus understands us. 
you know, quite often we say, doesn't, but he does. And we need to, 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 to grasp that and realise that because once we realise just how much God understands us, then we start to appreciate just how much he is with us and walking with us and helping us. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered in this way. God qualified him as a perfect high priest because of what Christ went through. Being the sacrifice, he became the perfect high priest. The high priest would go in every year and offer a sacrifice for the nation um, and sprinkle the blood over the Holy of Holies, over the, over the, the, the atonement seat inside the inner part of the, the tabernacle and in the temple. It carried with it a risk. He wasn't sure, the high priest was never sure whether God would judge him for his behaviour beforehand. Had he done the right sacrifices before going in? Had he cleansed himself before going in um, so that God wouldn't strike him down? Uh, and yet we don't read of anywhere where the high priest is struck down because of going into the, the Holy of Holies. Yes, there was the fear. I mean, the, the other priest tied a rope around his waist so that he did get struck down or he did die and they could pull him out and not go in because they knew they would die if they did go in. So, you know, you've got all that going on and yet Jesus gives himself as a sacrifice. Jesus doesn't go in to sprinkle the blood of an animal. Jesus' own blood is sprinkled down the side of Calvary for us. And that's what makes him the perfect high priest. And the verse goes on to say, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Eternal salvation. It's not temporary. It's not that you um, let God into your life uh, and you can lose him again. Uh, it's not that we, we need to keep on um, seeking salvation. Y yes, we, we keep on coming back and asking God to forgive us for the, the sins that we have done, but it's not that we're needing to be saved again. God has saved us once for all time. Again, think of what Jesus did. Th think of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And as he did that, um, how Peter says to him, oh, Christ, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you can have no part of me. And then Peter says, well, then wash all of me. Just don't wash my feet, wash all of me. And Jesus says that, no, you've already had a bath, so I only need to wash your feet. And it's that sense that salvation is once, and that cleansing is once, and it is complete. But the recognition that we'll still fall, and we'll still do things that we shouldn't do, and we'll still commit sins, and that we come back and ask Jesus to forgive us for those sins. So this verse talks about the eternal salvation. You know, it's there and it's done and it's dusted. God has forgiven us because of what Jesus has done. It says, and God designed him to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is God's son. It says that he sits on the throne at the right hand of God. So he is the prince of glory but he's also the high priest. Melchizedek was the ruler of his land, but also the high priest. He was their leader, but he was their servant. Um, we talk about God being a servant king, we talk about Jesus being the servant king, and we sing about it um, in, in that song, Servant King. And, and it really is that, that Jesus is for us. He is the king but he is a servant to us because of what he does. Again, that passage when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, he says, look, if you, if you want to lead others, you've got to serve them. And it's, it's actually learning about how we, we lead by example in serving others. And that's what Jesus does for us in the perfect way. And then that leads into what comes next. Because it says there's much more we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. The writer wants to explain more. The writer wants to expound on this more, but feels that there's no point. You know, he, he's saying to them, you're spiritually dull. You don't seem to listen. How often do we say something to somebody and they don't listen? How often are we accused ourselves of not listening? We say, oh, I, I didn't, didn't hear that. And somebody says, yeah, I've already told you that twice or three times. But yet we don't hear it. We, we just don't tune into it. Maybe because we're, we, we're busy. Maybe because we feel stressed. Maybe we're distracted by something. You know, but when it comes to God's word, we shouldn't be distracted. When it comes to God's word, 
and learning from God, we should make a definite time to do that. We should even make a definite plan to do that. You know, we should take a part of God's word to study it and to understand it. And we should look for those tools to help us to do that. You know, none of us, or very few people, are, are actually able to do that by themselves. We all read books. We all listen to what other people say. We all sit down with God's word then as well and, and, and try to learn from it. And that's what it's about. The writer here is quite harsh to the listeners. The writer says, You have been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. This feeds back into something else that Jesus said. Jesus at the Great Commission didn't say go and make um, believers or don't go and make Christians or go and make followers. He said go and make disciples. Go into all the nations and make disciples. You know, as we learn about God, then we should be passing on that learning. As we grow in maturity, we should be walking with others. Remember uh, what I said earlier about our experiences and how our experiences equip us to walk with others? Well, it's the same spiritually. It's as we learn, as we talk and as we share that with others, how we help others to learn. How those of us who are spiritually mature should be teaching those who are spiritually immature so that they become mature and then that they can teach others. It's that perpetual cycle where we should be always doing that um, and always looking out for others. You've been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. We should learn them. We should, we should learn the basic things about God's word and then build upon them. You know, it talks about in the Bible about building a house and building it on the, the right foundation. And the foundation is Christ and Jesus and, and the salvation which he gives us through what he's done for us on the cross. But how often have you seen a house that somebody has started to build and it's been abandoned? And you think, such a waste. Maybe it's a foundation level, maybe it's a bit more, maybe it's even got a roof on it and it gets abandoned and somebody can't finish it. That's what it's like for us if we stop trying to learn about God. We've got our foundation, we've got our salvation, but we've, we've only, we haven't finished building the house. Now we know we'll never finish building that house until we get to heaven, but we need to keep on building it. We need to keep on learning. We need to keep on striving. And, that, and that's, again, this, that, the sense from this writer. Um, you need to keep going. He says, you are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives with milk is still an infant and doesn't know what to do, doesn't know how to do what is right. Maybe there's something going on and there's a sin that's being repeated and repeated and repeated. Maybe that's why this writer is writing this particular line. Maybe he's challenging them and, and the people who, will, who received this letter knew rightly what he was talking about. They understood as soon as this was said, oh, we're getting called out for this. It said, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. We need to learn God's word. We need to learn what it is to live for God. Um, we start off with salvation. We start off by letting God into our lives. And then we slowly learn and we grow in that. Uh, you know, it's the, again the old example from, from, the, from the New Testament and from the Old Testament as well of Pharisees. Pharisees um, taught men what it was, taught boys to then grow up to be other Pharisees, to be teachers of the law. But they burdened them greatly with it. And Jesus wanted to lighten that burden. He talked about his yoke being light. Um, and yoke can, can be for teaching. It's not just like a yoke of oxen where you bind the oxen together, but a yoke can be their teaching as well. And Jesus wanted to make them realise that his teaching was different, that he wasn't burdening them in the same way and that they could learn and grow in him. And that's what it's about. Solid food for those who are mature. God wants us to be mature. 
He doesn't want us always to be needing to go over the basics, but he wants us to be digging deeper. Again, we're all at different levels. And for some of us, we can dig really deep. And for others of us, we can't dig that deep. But it's about keeping on trying. It's not about saying, oh, I can't do that and giving up. It's about keep on trying, keep, keep on reading. Go over it again, buy, it, buy another commentary to, to read, uh, listen to somebody else who's put something up online. Um, ask somebody who you trust, can you explain this to me? You know, that, that, that's what we do for each other. That's, you know, small groups. And, and that's what even why we're doing this as a Bible study, so that we can learn from God's word and we can grow in God's word. God wants us to grow so that we don't do what's wrong. It says that those who are an infant doesn't know how to do what is right. You know, and again, in, in, within church circles, we use words at times which we assume maybe that people know and we don't really explain it. We talked about um, justification and sanctification. We talk about salvation and, and growing. You know, whenever we let God into our lives, we become his, uh, and that's salvation. Now, for some people, they can recall a date and a time and a place, and they can say, yep, on that da- time, or that day, that's whenever I became a Christian. For others, it's like a process that, we, that they go through, um, where over time, they realise they let God in, and they realise that God is in their lives. You know, but, but for all of us, that's salvation. But then after that, God wants to change us and transform us. You know, Paul, whenever he writes the New Testament, talks about the old and the new, and the old nature and the new nature, the old person and the new person. God wants us to be a new person. That means learning how to live for him, um, which means that gradually each day we change and transform, or we are sanctified. And it's, it's letting God turn us around so that each day we live a little bit more for him. So that each day we learn and eventually we stop doing that sin which we have done, which we know what was wrong, but what we've struggled with. And then maybe there's another sin that we realize and and over time then we, we learn how not to do that sin and God transforms us and we grow closer to God. God wants us to grow closer to him each day. He wants us to be mature. He wants us to have solid food. So how are you feeling today? Do you feel like a baby today? Do you feel like a, a, a child or a teenager? Do you feel like an adult today in spiritual terms? You know, if we're honest, all of us are probably a bit of a mixture because there's some things that we know maybe in the Bible well. There's other things that we don't know very well. But God just wants us to grow in that so that we can grow closer to him and get to know him better each and every day. And the better we get to know him, the more that we realise just how great he is, what he has done for us. And then the more that we can walk with others and help them and teach them and let them see all that God has done for them. So where this week could you grow? What area of your spiritual life needs a little bit of work? What do you need to read a bit more about? What do you need to learn a bit more about? And then how can you pass that on to somebody else? There's a challenge for you for this week. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we have spent together. Lord, please do show us an area where we need to grow closer to you to um, read your word a bit more, to to, to gain that understanding. And then, Lord, once we gain that understanding, help us to be able to pass it on to others so they too can learn. And then, Lord, we can learn about something more so that we can grow closer again to you. Father, thank you. And go with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for watching. See you again uh, next week, same time, same place. Take care. God bless. Bye.